Good morning, world. Yeah, that didn't sound weird at all. My name's Daniel, and I'm working on a bachelor's degree in sociology with minor in psych, if that helps to establish my credibility any. If not, I'll just say that I really think you should listen to me. Just hear me out. I'll cite my sources, I'll, get, I'll bring the facts, I'll do everything right, I promise. But I have some important things to say, so I hope to stick around. I'm going to talk about belief perseverance today, which is a big, imposing psychological term at first. But you realize that it's just the term for fundamental stubbornness. It's that thing where people refuse to change their held beliefs in response to new incoming packets of information known as true facts. If you're like me, by which I mean a functioning adult who tries to keep an open mind about things, then you have definitely experienced this before. Do you have a friend who refuses to accept evolution as fact? instead of just some theory floating around in your head? Or that relative at Thanksgiving with whom you strenuously avoid talking about anything but the turkey? Because you know then they'll start talking about Planned Parenthood selling baby parts, or autism caused by vaccines. To which everyone else can only reply, Yeah, <clears throat> and the stuffing's good too. If so, they may be suffering from belief perseverance. Seek psychological or educational help immediately. Once you have an open mind about things, which is a hell of a lot of work to maintain, mind you, then you start to get a good eye for when people start to dig in their heels about things. So we all recognize the symptoms, but what exactly is this thing? I mean, is it Streptococcus bullheadicus? Infects people and makes them impervious to new information, like the cold makes people impervious to inflow of oxygen through the nose? No, unfortunately the answer is much more complicated, though fascinating. And I guarantee you it has nothing to do with cigars, penises, or wanting to bonk your mom. Shove it, Freud! Psychologists coined the term belief perseverance when studying experimental debriefing. Right, so it occurs to me that most of you are not Phil Zimbardo, a fact for which we should be extremely grateful. Creepy bastard! So briefly, psychological experiments often use deception on their subjects. Depending on what behavior you're studying, if the subjects know you're studying it, they might alter their behavior and skew your results. Accuracy demands that subjects be placed in a scenario where they will display that behavior behavior without getting wise. And then, ethics demand that once you've gotten your data, you reveal your deception. A process called debriefing. Especially if the scenario could potentially be traumatizing to your subjects. Again, something that if you're Zimbardo, you know plenty about. So in the late 60s, psychologists started testing whether these debriefing procedures actually worked. Whether they eliminated that lasting impression that some deception procedures could produce. They found that in many cases, test subjects still believe parts of the false scenario they were put in for the experiment, even after debriefing. The reason they retained these beliefs, according to them, was so that the mind could avoid cognitive dissonance. You may not think you know what that means, but you definitely do. It's that really mentally uncomfortable feeling you get when you're told that something you thought was right was actually wrong and you have to accept it. Picture the day you found out that Santa Claus wasn't real or how nice Columbus really was to the Native Americans. That kind of sick to your stomach feeling combined with the urge to go Yeah, sorry to make you feel that all over again. Or to any children watching feeling that for the first time right now because of me. Sorry. But that's exactly what we're talking about here, with cognitive dissonance, and that's how you know it's a real thing and how powerful that emotion can be. So powerful it really makes you want to believe that the incoming information is false instead of the information you already had. And that would be a pretty strong motivator for belief perseverance, but that's not the end of the story. The real landmark study in belief perseverance came in 1975 when Ross, Lepper, and Hubbard took the experiment two or three steps further. They gave subjects a task and told them they either did a good job, a bad job, or an average job. In fact, the feedback had been fabricated to see if the subject would retain a belief about their own abilities. After some stewing time, the experimenter said, Yeah, we lied. We were actually studying the galvanic skin response you produced when you were told that you did a good, bad, or average job. That's why there are electrodes on your head. Oh! So all that feedback we gave you was made up. Don't even worry about it at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> See where this is going? Sure enough, when they were asked to rate themselves based on the skills they just displayed, they stuck to their false feedback. The ones arbitrarily assigned to success thought they would do really well, and the ones assigned to failure thought they would do not so well. But it didn't stop there. The researchers then repeated the experiment, this time with an observer attached to each subject, who clandestinely observed the subjects completing the task and receiving their false feedback. Turns out observers got belief perseverance about their observees' abilities too, so it's not just an emotional thing. So, what the hell does this all mean? It means it's not just the need for emotional stability that makes us push away facts that disagree with our current knowledge. There's something much more cognitive about it, rooted in how we actually process the information, not just how we feel about it. Ross Lepper and Hubbard posited that it's based on cognitive biases. We all have them, it's just the way we are. They're based on schemata, or the basic psychological processes for mental categorization. Schemata allow us to do great things, like compare and contrast objects and remember procedures we use in our lives. But they can also provide the foundation for behaviors like racial discrimination and belief perseverance. So yeah, definitely a mixed bag there. In any case, starting with those landmark studies, several findings have evolved about how belief perseverance works. Most confirm or further explain the results or posit new theories. Two things stand out, however. Number one, belief perseverance is really complex and it's rooted in the basic way in which we observe and process the world around us. And number two, it works. It works really well. 
In fact, you might say it works horrifically, world-endingly well. And this is what I really want to say about Belief Perseverance today. It's so bad. Seriously, it inflicts so much damage on us as people and as a species. If we can't accept new facts, we can't change our minds. If we can't change our minds, we can't change our policies. And if we can't change our policies, we can't adapt to the world around us. And if you've ever wondered why we advanced so much farther technologically in 2 million years than the dinosaurs did in 190, it's because we can adapt. We can change our behavior to fit the environment and therefore survive more drastic changes in the environment than other species. At this point, we can even change the environment to suit our needs. But along with this really fast and impressive evolution came mental complexity. We formed a mind, a soul, a conscience, etc. Which means now, genetic mutations ill-suited to the environment are not the only things that can be naturally selected out of existence. It will also weed out groups of organisms that decide by free will not to adapt to their environment. Like us. I don't know about you, but I really don't want to be selected for extinction because we altered the atmosphere so irreversibly that we're roasting ourselves. Especially if the people we put in power to do something about it use their reality-altering free will not to do anything about it. So what can we do? Well, the designers of that first experiment found the first step, and I'm taking part in it right now. I'm teaching you. I'm telling you about how this stuff affects us. In the second part of that experiment, one group was not only told that they were deceived, but it was explained to them how exactly they were deceived, for real, and how unhealthy it would be for them to do anything but just accept the absolute truth. And it pretty much worked! Later studies have confirmed this, like studies about anti-vaxxers. Researchers found that the most difficult type of anti-vaxxer to persuade to vaccinate their children were those who had already absorbed the literature. The literature, of course, around that original study that connected vaccines to autism. Fun fact, the journal later forced him to retract that article, mainly because it was bullshit. I mean, usually you have to commit fraud for something like that to happen, but he managed to do it just by being so undeniably wrong. But the damage was done. He scared a lot of people, and beliefs persevered. So the ones who had absorbed all that literature were obviously the hardest to persuade. But in the end, the researchers found only one way to do it. That's right, process debriefing. Laying all the valid evidence before a person, explaining why the information they had already absorbed was incorrect, and hoping they would make the right choice and break the perseverance. It doesn't have a 100% success rate, but it's the only way to make progress with that kind of a believer. There also is actually a scientific basis for letting cooler heads prevail. Turns out belief perseverance increases with heart rate. Weird, but true. Evolutionarily it makes sense. When our bodies are in stress, we're programmed to rely pretty heavily on what we already know and block out all other information. Scientists have noticed that we seem to have two psychological processing systems, System 1 and System 2. System 1 includes all those cognitive biases and schemata that allow us to make very quick and efficient, if not very nuanced, decisions. System 2 includes our more rational, mathematical side, which is slower, but much more detailed. But guess which system we rely on in a stressful situation? It's not the rational one! So yeah, if we have politically and emotionally charged issues, where absorption of new information is required to effectively solve the problem, then we should do all we can to make sure those conversations go smoothly, slowly, and civilly. On an individual level, we should do our best to handle big, scary issues as calmly as possible. We should accept that quick and easy solutions, however tempting, are usually completely inviolable to solving big, complex problems. Patience, grasshopper. Also, if you hear controversial new facts about a controversial issue, please take the time to explore the source of that information. Is the information well explained and well documented? Are the authors knowledgeable and competent? Do the authors have anything to gain by convincing you of a falsehood? It is a lot of work, but it's worth every bit to get the solution right. I think it's also important not to be ashamed of getting things temporarily wrong from time to time. Like, yeah, I may have been wrong, but what did it do other than lose me time? If I did or said anything based on that wrong information that had consequences, I will do my best to clean it up. And as for time loss, it's way faster than trying to convince myself I'm still right against all facts to the contrary. In the end, I have faith that we will eventually solve all these complex problems. We are constantly evolving and figuring out the right answers and getting those answers to the people in power to make things happen. But if we all do our due diligence, learning about how our thoughts work and trying our best to keep them rational, then we can all solve problems a lot quicker, saving us a lot of time and suffering. So let's all take a deep breath and accept the fact that we may be misinformed sometimes. It's not our fault, it's natural, and it's usually reversible. We just need to make sure that we do our absolute best to keep ourselves as fully informed as possible and correct the mistakes when they happen. World, I'll see you tomorrow.